<laughs> hey, Denise R., it's my pleasure to see you. How's your soul? My soul is good. All right. Tell You know what? Usually I'm the one that starts talking, and I just want to welcome people to um, Trauma Survivors Walking Each Other Home, a weekly program every Monday evening, afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. And um, we invite you to join us as we take on topics that relate to how can we live a good life, live our, live our own life as trauma survivors. And I'd like to ask Denise to share whatever she, now obviously we got the extrovert on this side of the room, <laughs> introvert on that side of the room, and that's okay. I love Denise. So whatever she says is just fine with me. So Denise, what would you like to say to start us off today, if anything? Uh, to start us off? Um, it's a beautiful day. I'm looking out the window. Snowflakes are flying. What? Yeah. Snowflakes in Toledo, Ohio. We used to say, it's snowing in Toledo. It is. Snow. Go ahead. Keep going. It's beautiful. And I'm, I'm happy to be here with you and ready to talk about our people-pleasing behaviors. Mm. Let's talk about that. And I want to say, you know, so many songs come to mind when I think of the snow is snowing, the wind is blowing, but I will weather the storm. What do I care if icicles form? I got my love to keep me warm. Love it, honey. By the way, <laughs> did you see the moon last night, Denise? It was one of those wonderful filling in splinters. Yep. Yeah. Put near half. Put near half. Denise and I both as children love the song. Would you like to swing on a star? <laughs> Carry moonbeams home in a jar. Boom, boom, boom. You can be better off than you are. Or would you rather be a trauma survivor? <laughs> <laughs> but we are. We are. And so we are. We are making our, how, how is that? There's a great quote. It says, take your pain, let your painful past be your greatest asset. And so, um, folks, we invite you to participate along with Denise and me. And if you push on the chat function, we can see who's here. We can get your comments. We would be delighted to, to pick up and, and respond. And, you know, if eventually you're comfortable, you can also uh, join us in video. But let's start with joining us in uh, on the chat. So just ch click on chat and whatever you got to say, either Denise or I, one of us will watch it and catch it because we have one of the great traits of trauma survivors, which is hyper. Uh, hyper vigilance. We watch <laughs> everything. We see it all, honey. Ain't nothing. I we're got gonna the chat. I'll um, watch it. Thank you so much. So yep. great. So my friends, why would people pleasing and what is people pleasing? But why would people pleasing be a topic for trauma survivors? Denise, what is people pleasing? Uh, people pleasing it after all these years is uh, when you deny your own sensations in order to accommodate others. And it probably started for safety, mm -hmm. you know, to keep ourselves safe. And uh, especially women, as women, as girls, we learn to, our our stuff is second. But, you know, our feelings are not the most important. Whoever the man is, those, that's who you attend to. That's what I learned in my house. Do you remember any of the things that any of the things that your mother said to you about how to be with boys? Well, I was a tomboy, so uh, I, I, she still yeah, told me. <laughs> I got in a little bit, you know, I got in a little trouble for being, you know, like a boy. Girl, I got me in a fight. I was um, I was a tom girl, tomboy, whatever. And yet, when I went in the house, my mother and father were all into girls being ladylike. Right, ladylike. Wearing white gloves to church. You didn't have to do that only oh, on my. Easter. Only on Easter we had gloves. Oh, uh, every every Sunday, gloves, white gloves, and the, you know, families tell stories about. Their parents tell stories or caregivers tell stories about the children and those stories can sum up what the parent parents stereotype of the child was. 
So I'm talking about this because my parents always used to say of my oldest sister, who was the golden girl in the family, she was the perfect one. Her name was, of course, Karen. And Karen um, got all dressed up in this blue velvet suit. That I don't know where she, my mother got this blue velvet suit. It was a beautiful sort of royal blue and it had jodfers, you know, like back in the day, um, riders used to wear these jodfers, which were pants that like puffed out on the side mm. so you could get on a horse more easily. Anyway, so Karen had these, this outfit um, and usually outfits got passed down to my next sister and then to me, but I never got those jodfers, but they look cool to me. Anyways, <laughs> Karen had this blue velvet outfit and every Sunday when she wore the blue velvet outfit or any other outfit, she had to put on her white gloves. And here's the story my mother told about Karen. She said Karen would keep her hands like this or like this, and she wouldn't touch anything because I had told her that she had to keep her white gloves clean. So I picture this perfect little girl right. people walking around. You know, like not touching anything and and not and taking her gloves off. Those impulses to the maximum of wanting to touch this, or because I wanted oh. to touch everything. Yes. How else would we know it if we didn't touch it or taste it or breathe it or you know? And and I, I don't know about you. Were you a, a kinesthetic learner? Yes. Ah, see, now this is interesting because both you and I were kinesthetic learners. Can you tell folk that might not be familiar with um, all the different learning styles, what that means, multiple intelligence as well? To touch it, that's all. I, I have to touch it. And uh, like, if I want to learn my ABCs, I have to, you know, oh, him, I got to do it with my body, right? Yeah, yeah. I bet those people that did YMCA. <laughs> yeah, that's my, that's my alphabet. That's right, honey. They probably, some of those guys were probably kinesthetic learners. And kinesthetic, as Denise said, I think it just means movement. And it means we have to, to move and touch and experience something with our bodies to, to be able to know it. And so for me, I knew snow, but it was wonderful when it was okay to do snow angels. Right. I want, I was tasting the snow. Thank God nobody, somebody told me, don't you dare put your tongue on a frozen pipe. <laughs> I actually did that once, not on a pipe. My friend, uh, Lori Obi, she had a uh, ice skating rink in the backyard with a drinking fountain next to it. She, it was a large family. They did a lot of activities out there. And I put my tongue on that drinking fountain. You know how oh. it has a little metal piece that would go? Oh, over? Yeah. Oh, my God. That. I had to. I, I know, I just had to do it. <laughs> what happened sweetie did it stick it ripped a piece off yeah oh i'm not scarred my your mouth actually heals the fastest of things because it's warm it, it heals yeah it has it to heals. heal it has to heal too because it's so important but wow. it was bad yeah. Ouch, that was like really hurt okay yeah. my friends so we're talking about kinesthetic learners because Growing up, I want to ask you who are listening, how did you learn what we were supposed to be like as a kid? Who taught you and what did they teach you? And when it came to gender, what did you learn about gender? And Denise and I have both said we were we were Tom Goy boys or Tom girls. I mean, I was out there climbing trees, I was out there climbing hills, I was out there. Uh, swinging on swings that were too big for me that I wasn't supposed to swing on. I, in fact, I got in a fight with one of the older brothers. He was five years older than me, but my good friend, Janie, Janie G, and she uh, lived up the street and she had two older brothers. And her older brother, she loved dearly. To me, he was kind of a bully. And so he was picking on me and I wanted to stop him. So as a as a girl thinking, I can stop him. I went over to him. He said, come on, let's fight. I mean, this guy's like twice as big as I am. He should never have said that, but he did. So I got into a fight with him. And what did he do? He picked me upside down, twirled me around and dumped me. And I landed on my wrist on his boots. And his sometimes boots in the day used to have steel inside them. Right, you know? steel-toed boots. Steel-toed boots. And I landed right on that. And I knew 
in a heartbeat that my wrist was broken. I just felt it. I knew it was broken. But as a survivor, I wasn't going to let anybody know that he had hurt me. I wasn't going to let him know. I wasn't going to let him feel like he had won. And the message beneath all of this was, you're a girl. You're not supposed to fight like that. You you get in a fight. Look what happens. You get get, get beaten up. So I remember just saying uh, to my friend Janie, not to Dick, I just, to the brother, I said, I I, got to go home. I got to Gotta go home right now. Walked all the way down, lit, taking care of myself, being the parentified child. I said to my parents, I, I broke my wrist. I need to go see a doctor. And they got kind of fluttered. And my mother got this big long jewelry box. Back in the day, there used to be long jewelry boxes. I'm not quite sure why, maybe for necklaces or something. It was a cardboard box that said bongs, jewelry on it. So she said, put your hand, arm on this. I put my arm on this. We wrapped a towel around it, and that's how I went, got the arm x-rayed, and yeah, it was a broken wrist. And I had broken the rules, and I got a broken wrist as a result of that. Um, I don't know if I told my parents how I got the broken wrist. I probably, to be safe, said, I just fell down. But in that one experience, Denise, there were so many messages, message about being a girl. Right. You you, you fight. They're not going to fight fair. (laughs) <laughs> this guy wasn't going to fight fair. I mean, he was right. five years older than me, but he was going to yes. show me who was in charge. And he did. He caused harm. I would fight with this boy on the way home from school. We had to walk, you know, a mile or so home. In the and snow, I would wait in the hide. rain. Yeah, everything. <laughs> everything. And I would hide and jump out and beat beat this boy up i don't know why all right yeah do you have any memory about why it was just him no but was i would beat in, him up and then go you home. beat him up would you was he in your class yeah i Did think they fight? might have like tried to tell me he likes you that's why he picks on you oh, that's a crack oh, of crap i'm i don't want him to like me you know i'm gonna get rid of him, him. yeah <laughs> So he picked on you? He must have like picked on me in the classroom or something. And but I it was many days in a row that I waited for him and would jump out and get him. And what happened? Did he fight back? I don't know. I always beat him up and left. I don't I don't think he fought, fought back. I mean, we we're about the same size and I don't know. I would get hurt him and then get away. Wow. Did you get in any trouble for that? No, I was kind of unsupervised. What about the boys? I hear you, me too. But what about the boy's mother? Did she ever complain? uh, The boys wouldn't tell. The the girl had done it. Right. A girl beat me up? No. So here we're getting to the bottom of people pleasing. Denise, does this have anything to do with people pleasing, do you think? All this stuff that we were all these laws we were breaking right we were you know socialized to be people pleasers and you know we took it on we believed it we lived it and uh you know it still affects me today only five years ago six years ago i was in a classroom and with the same teaching assistant named connie she Mm -hmm. was with me for like five years and uh Every day she would have to tell me you were awesome today. And I would that that, you know, now when I look back upon it, yes, I was an awesome Mm -hmm. teacher. But -hmm. when I was in it, I did not Mm -hmm. experience myself as awesome. So I I was I hear you. Go ahead. That's my most recent example of I really needed her to tell me that you know Mm -hmm. a lot of days and she Mm -hmm. did now did you do so she gave you the feedback that you needed and we all need to hear you're doing a good job we you know you did you really did great things with the kids today here's an example we didn't hear that but I want to ask 
well, let me say my statement. I think you you were working with the children in the way you worked with the children because you loved the children. You weren't people pleasing Connie right. to get a compliment. You were doing what you right. needed. Exactly. I was. I wasn't people pleasing. I was doing my best work. Mm-hmm. And, and um, you're saying it, you needed it helped. What did it feel like when somebody said, good job? I loved it. It, it made me feel like I somebody saw me. Yeah, for real she really saw me because the three things that a tra traumatized child and i want to say adults always need is to be seen somebody sees you denise somebody sees me you holly to be heard they're listening to yep. what we say and they believe us right the third thing is to be believed so i'm gonna uh, listen uh, denise got five years ago honey i got last week i got Two days ago, for people pleasing, if 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 that if it if the part of people pleasing that Denise is talking about is really looking forward to hearing that we're doing a good job, I I'm 78 years old and I and I love that. I'm not I don't as much I don't very often manipulate so that I'll hear that, but when right. I hear that. Uh, here's another trait of a trauma survivor: hearing a compliment was one of the hardest things for me. True for you too. Yeah. Why so hard for us? Do you think? Uh, we didn't believe it. I didn't believe it. Somebody must be trying to get something out of me. They're manipulating me. Right. First off, they. Why would any? I never heard at home. I love you. I never got a hug. I never got good job. I never heard any of that. Excellence was expected, and anything less than perfect was to be abused over and perfection was expected right so it wasn't like you know like you were taking care of both of your your siblings right and i doubt if you heard boy denise you're such a good big sister <laughs> right know? no never it was just never. like okay that's what you do and and what you said up front was really pretty true when you said why do we people please what's your take on that today why do we people please even as adults um, to get positive feedback, I guess, or, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I still like positive feedback. Yeah. So I think you're saying it's something that's very helpful to hear. Uh, doing well and hearing about it. That's a natural thing that somebody sees us and gets us and says, wow. And so that's beautiful. The people pleasing part of it that starts to get into, for me, starts to get into the illness is when I don't have any self-esteem on my own. And so I try to manipulate and please somebody else so that I can guarantee that they will tell me, good job. Now, I'm not doing that much anymore at all. But the other reason for people pleasing, besides hearing good job and positive reinforcement, which trauma, traumatized kids don't get, Denise, here's the other reason for me. See if this is true for you. Why people please? Because it was an expression of fear. Because you if want to I, fit, fit in, or yeah. First you're off, afraid I afraid you're not going to fit. I was afraid in my family if I didn't keep my mother calm and please her, she might fall into a fit of mental illness, and those were terrifying. Yeah. I people please my father because he was a narcissist, and if I didn't keep him away from his rage, he his rage would come out on me. So I was afraid of both of them. Right. And so people pleasing was a way to to um soothe them, calm them, give them whatever they needed so they wouldn't hurt me. So what you're saying I I agree with is like I need praise, I'm not getting it. So people pleasing is a way to get that. And the very sad thing about that is that we come to depend like a codependent does on somebody else's definition of ourselves. The other part of it is I people pleased and still can feel that need in me when I'm afraid I'm going to get rejected. Not your thing about afraid I'll be rejected. When I'm afraid I'll be rejected or afraid that I'll be harmed or, um, and this is the worst, banished. It's powerful to me, Denise, that, and we see this in the classroom with little kids all the time, Maslow was not correct on this when he said the most important need we have is to be fed and have a roof over our head and 
not have clothes that keep us covered up and warm. No, for trauma survivors and maybe everybody else, the most important need we have is to belong. Right. And when I tell the true story about my sister, the one who became a psychiatrist, it was a failure to thrive baby. Have you ever known a, a failure to thrive baby, Denise, or heard of one? I was a failure to thrive. You were too. Mm-hmm. What does that mean to people listening that might not know? Um, I The only thing I know is uh, either my mom didn't know how or didn't do it, the feeding and mm-hmm. taking. And uh, so you fail to gain weight. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and I believe I went back to the hospital. And, you know, that's you all I know. I, that's I plenty, was, right? Yeah, I was born small and premature and then um, had failure to thrive and, you know, had to be go back to the hospital. I believe. I think that's what happened. Girl, I, I want to. Stories are, you know, shaky. <laughs> yeah, I know. My mother told a story about how I had such long curly hair when I was born that the nurses took strips of the umbilical cord and tied ribbons from the umbilical cord. And I believed her. She was my mother. It was just like you're saying, you hear this stuff. How do we know we can believe it? When right. I got old enough to know, I said to my mother, how could the nurses have done that? And, she's, and she didn't respond. She said, because it was her reality. She believed right. that. But I only learned about failure to thrive babies from my sister, who was a failure to thrive baby. And my oldest sister was so good at, Karen was so good at keeping family secrets. She might have been failure to thrive too, but um, I never heard about that. Lynn was a failure to thrive baby and she didn't put on, I think she weighed like five or six pounds. So it's pretty normal, but she lost weight. And my mother apparently tried breastfeeding with the with our oldest sister. It didn't work. And so she just quit. So, um, but that meant formula, right? And how can a kid not eat formula? But my, Lynn somehow didn't. So she had to go back to the hospital. And this was during World War II because she was born in 19... 19- 42 with blackouts at night, you know, and um, until she put on weight, until she put on weight, but nobody followed up with the family. That's the whole thing that we were talking about last need last week, that um, the whole thing is to reunite the family and keep the family unit together. So nobody followed up. So there was my sister. Yes, she got food and she got a roof over her head, but there was, no love and there was abuse that's what she got when i came along sweetie i weighed ready for this i was overdue now again my mother told me i was born on thanksgiving Uh, okay but i wasn't born for a whole month later that didn't make sense when i got older i believe my mother she said you were supposed to come on thanksgiving and they just had the boy's name picked out for me because they didn't they were sure I was going to be a boy and it was the last kid they could have. And they really wanted a boy. No questions asked, non-negotiable. When I was born on December 31st, my mother still told that myth that I was due on Thanksgiving. I didn't know that was crazy, but I was 10 pounds, eight ounces. Wow. That's a huge bombina, huge. And my mother was this Uncle little- Uncle. Yeah, honey, I chunk of luck over like, woo, woo. And, yeah. and I always told this joke about myself that I was, um, I knew it was going to be bad when I got out of the womb. <laughs> but, you know, we, because don't kids that are traumatized have kind of gallows humor? Yes. Can you think about that? Did you ever do that? Like, well, I do tend to be a little sarcastic sometimes. Yeah. And what's sarcasm all about? Yeah, I don't know, but uh, I do have to monitor myself for that at times. It, humor is a way of getting at the truth, right. right? And so a lot of times people use humor. But if, if we can't say something directly, we'd say it indirectly. Right. And I, I used to do that a lot. Now, I did it mostly to keep myself safe. So if somebody was doing something and I wanted them to stop, I would joke with them rather than confront them. Because if I confronted them, I would get hurt. Right. Like I confronted that guy five years older than me and I got, he dumped me on my 
told me, picked me up and threw me down. Boom. And I got hurt. So you're right, Denise, that using humor sarcastically, what message do you did you give to people that you don't necessarily want to give everybody anymore when you're sarcastic? Well, some people take it as mean. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to be mean, so. Mm-hmm. So I monitor myself on it. Mm-hmm. Some people disguise um, cruelty by joking about it. In fact, the, the most common one that you've probably heard yourself is uh, a man, since we're talking here somewhat about gender stuff, a, a traditional man saying to a a woman um, after he says something really demeaning, what's wrong with you? Can't you take a joke? Right. Have you heard that? Yeah. Can you remember any of the context in which you heard that? No, I don't. I try to avoid men as much as possible. <laughs> you had some good guys in Head Start too, though, right? Yeah, there are. There but, are. You know. And those guys you wouldn't do that with because you wouldn't have to be satirical because they wouldn't say something like that, right? I'm right. trying to get my hair dry here. Um, I, you know, when I was a woman in the field I was in before, which was law, I was the only woman in most situations, the only woman on a board, only woman practicing in that county of Maine. And I would hear this all the time. Um, somebody would say something like, nice job for a woman. Nice right. job for a girl. <clears throat> I, but in early childhood, it's mostly women. So I made out okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, you know, I heard... Law. Not in law and not in, not out there in general. I still hear guys saying, and not sensitive, caring guys, but guys will still say, what's wrong with you? Can't you take a joke? First year of law school when the men didn't want us there. They didn't want us there. and They would like really niggle away at us and, um, and niggle away meant they just like take chips out of us, whatever they could. And one guy said to me, well, I remember, I could see him saying this. The guy's like, 60 something years old now but he was like we were all in our 20s at the time and he came up to me and he said um yeah it's okay you're here it's okay you're here so well, thanks <laughs> what, what 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 do you mean and he said uh well the fact that you're here means i'll have less competition to get a job when we graduate and i looked at him and said what does that mean and he like rolled his eyes like how stupid can you be Right. Stupid I be, but yeah, I, I got it. What he meant is that nobody was going to hire, or girls, or w- women. And you know what? In the in Portland, Maine, where I was in law school, he was right. And his father was an attorney. M- many of the guys in my class were going into their father's law firms. Those law firms didn't have women. Not only that, if there was a, a big law firm, there was always a woman, and she was always in the back room. And her expertise was in something called property law, where she did all of this, to me, would have been fantastically boring, detailed research, and nobody ever saw her. Very few women were allowed to go to court. And so what did I do? I went to court. And the first time I went to court in this southern county of Maine, I was so focused on doing my job that I didn't look around the courtroom. I was just looking at my client, looking at the judge, looking at the, um, actually, I'm sorry, I was prosecuting. So I wasn't looking at my client. I was looking at the judge and the, and the, and the public defender and, um, and we won. And I didn't look up until the end. And I just happened to look up or maybe somebody said to me, did you look up lining the courtroom? in this southern county of Maine were all the men that were members of the bar in that county. They lined up to see the show of a woman. How would she do? Now, wow. nobody, nobody said to me, hey, it's great you're here. We want rooting for you. Want you to do a good job. No. And afterwards, nobody said, great job. No, no, no. They just wanted... excuse me they just wanted to probably if i was going to fail i didn't fail and they walked out 
And it was under really tough circumstances, too. Um, the uh, district attorney at that time, who was supposed to be supervising me, was on, uh, he was being disciplined. And so I would come in as this third year law student, and he'd have a bunch of these um, cases, and he would just like hold them up like this which one do you want? Pick one, pick one. <laughs> so I picked one. I had no idea what I was going to get. So he was no support. He just, you know, he thought it was funny. He was being disciplined. And so I don't know what he was doing there. I just sat down and handed these things out. Fortunately, the attorney general's office for the state of Maine was uh, in charge of making sure things went right. So I could ask people if I needed help. But back to people pleasing, you're saying it's for one reason, which I totally get. And I'm saying it's for the other reason. So you're saying it's because we need to hear that we're we're making people happy because that we're don't okay, hear. right? And that makes us that makes me okay, and that we're worthy. We're worthy. We're okay, and to me, I have the right to exist. And right. and I'm actually able to be competent. You were very competent, Denise, as a five-year-old, six-year-old, seven-year-old, raising those younger siblings of yours. I was not a good student, however, but I, I was competent out in the world. And you were a competent caregiver to those little girls. Right. You really were. But, but who would ever say, Denise, thanks for being the mom to these kids? Because that would have been telling the truth. And telling the truth would have always got us into trouble. Yeah, I mean, I didn't really know how to be a mom, and I wasn't trying to be a mom. I was just trying to help my mom, trying to please my mom. Mm -hmm. And as a result, what did you learn to do? Like, just tell me a couple practical things you learned to be and do with your sisters that really helped. Hmm. Well, I mean, I know I prepared food or, you know, we had chores when we were very young even yes we right bathroom emptied the ashtrays that was a job that we had uh you know got the bottles threw away uh put the diapers in the hamper the diaper hamper and did you change diapers too i i don't know i was very still pretty young i mean i was only like 17 months older than my mm -hmm. second sister yeah. I don't know. I just was parentified. You know, I was my mom's helper. Mm -hmm. I didn't really take on the mothering so much because I didn't know how. I mean, mm -hmm. my example was uh, not that nurturing. Mm -hmm. but, you, I, I hear you. So you but you knew and you figured out what was a necessity. The baby had to get fed. The little right. one had to get fed. The little one had to get to bed. The little one had to get clean, right? Brush teeth. Was we that had brush part? teeth. Okay. Okay. That was not one of our practices. Wow. We brushed teeth, but never knew about dental floss. I was like an adult before I learned about dental floss. Yeah. I was like seven years ago when I never flossed my teeth and I got really bad gum disease. Mm -hmm. And but I had a surgery that corrected it. Oh, good. I'm glad it worked. But now oh, I floss good. religiously right. twice a day. Oh, yeah. It's interesting because the self care the self care principles that we learned weren't always there. I didn't ever no. learn. You know, I'm kind of stuck a bit today because I never learned from my mother how to take care of my hair. Um, and not only that, my mother was when she was in one of her states, she would insist on washing our hair in the kitchen sink. We couldn't, we took baths and we weren't supposed to take, I don't know how, what we're supposed to do to get our hair clean, but we took baths all together in the same bathtub. And we were taught very, I don't mean to be um, too graphic about this, but there were parts of our body we couldn't touch. You suds up other parts, but you couldn't touch other parts. Yeah, and we did that too. I, we were three girls in the bathtub. Yep, and you just there's just some parts off off and I said, So how am I supposed to get clean? You know, I was all sweating stuff. Right. 
a water filter and pull the water away. No soap, no nothing. I mean, it was like, it's the strangest thing to me. And so somehow we didn't wash our hair except once a week. My mother would put us, we'd get up on this stool and she'd put our push our heads down underneath the sink. Yeah, this really yes, underneath the faucet. Yeah, we yes. did this. Oh my God. And she would just and um then the water we got it was it, it could have been an act of love. Do you remember that being an act of love at all? No. No. More like it was a duty or whatever that she had to do. I really only oh. remember it because I have a I have a photograph of me over the sink with my mom, you know, washing my hair. hair. I don't really remember the experience of it, but I have a photograph of me over the sink getting my hair washed. And I don't know if this is true for you, but some, but often I forgot. <clears throat> I didn't want to remember things that were really unpleasant, to say the least, painful, abusive. <clears throat> but I remember my mother um, hurting. She was hurting. When she was angry, she shoved my head right down underneath that water. Sometimes the water was too hot. Um, you know, I wasn't supposed to scream. Um, she'd, uh, you know, just be really rough about the way she did that. And then it was my job to go dry off my hair. I never, ever was taught how to do anything with my hair. Were you? Were you taught uh, how to take care of your hair? Obviously, my hair was long. Well, then we got pixies. Uh, no, I never learned to do makeup, okay. to do self-care paint my nails none of that we she didn't she didn't do that we, i had a foster sister ah. she, i think she would go to the beauty shop salon once a week and get her hair done but we <laughs> we didn't yeah uh but we had a foster sister and she wore makeup so i learned you know i would go and watch wow. her but i never really like she would encourage me to try it and whatnot wow. Wow. I remember but, see, in the really, my mother was uh, evangelical born again. And so there were rules uh, like it couldn't go to anything, couldn't do anything on a Sunday, couldn't especially go to movies and uh, couldn't wear makeup, um, had to wear appropriate clothing. Um, and so I remember wanting to wear Lipstick, I thought it would be really fun. My mother always wore this bright pink lipstick, like a really bright fuchsia. And she had blue eyes and it really looked great. And I thought, well, this is fun. I watched her putting the makeup on. And so my older sisters wanted to wanted to try makeup. And she, no, they weren't allowed to. The one thing that they were allowed to do, and people listening will remember this. If you're a girl, Tangi. Tangi, oh, you didn't get this. Tangi was this pretend lipstick which came in a lipstick container but when you opened it it was just like this all it was was kind of a lip balm you put it on and for a minute your lips might look like they glistened a little bit because you know lip balm does that and then it would go away now the girls that were not as supervised or maybe they came from sophisticated families they were allowed to wear makeup and they did and there i was i never learned makeup i didn't i didn't yeah. learn it when i was when i would be have to do things where i would be um like one of the things that i did when i had a radio show was we used to have a um a, a bam radio network um gala each year in washington dc at one of those theaters and they'd say yeah we got to get there ahead of time to put our makeup on and i would say to the people i don't have a clue how to do makeup. All I know is lipstick. Back in the day, I didn't do concealer. Now I do some concealer, maybe a little bit of rouge. That's all I knew to do. It's all I still know to do. And so I had this woman, Dr. So-and-so, Susan Offit, who was getting an award and she came from Minnesota or something. And she, I just sat back when she did my makeup. <laughs> I didn't look any different, I, I thought, but I had all this junk on my face. Right. I never liked it. It would make my eyes. Uh, the thing that was in what, during my high school years, let's say that's when people usually try makeup, mm -hmm. uh, blue eyeshadow, that light blue eyeshadow. 
-huh. And I tried to put it on and it got all in my eyeballs and I, I hated it. Right. I washed it off. That's why I can't fathom putting on those fake eyelash things. Right. I um I just can't imagine putting something on my eye. But what we're talking about here is that we were raised with some really strict rules. Right. And the strict rules meant we didn't have choices. We didn't have choices about what our roles were. And maybe people who are listening who are younger, you've had more choices, which is great. And yet, if you were traumatized at any age, including right now, the message is please people because they're not going to like you unless you do right so there's yeah. the third thing denise you're talking about you're saying yeah, to feel worthy to feel like somebody cares to feel like you're doing a competent job you got to get feedback from other people because how why was it we couldn't give feedback to ourselves like that um i don't know did you ever get it modeled for you no. No. I don't think so. I don't, my parents were, I don't know about your mom, but my parents, both of them were very strict about don't ever tell any of the girls that they've done something well because that'll go to their heads. Right. I remember you saying that before that you were denied that because it would go to your head. I do remember a little bit of that. Don't give her a big head big head that was yeah. <laughs> the girls couldn't have big heads but we were right. taught i was taught to make the boy feel like he could always win feel like he was always right and that he was fascinating hang on his every word right These are things my mother taught me and i'm going what the h is this about this guy's I remember going through that uh time when i was like annoyed because men think they have to re rule the conversation like they're in charge of the entertainment they're in charge of the information i remember i went through a period of time when i was like that's dumb you know mm -hmm. that's i don't know why they take that on <laughs> i couldn't stand to be with a man who who would do that i mean i chose interesting guys that I could have conversations with. Um, I had no idea about how to be with anybody. It, it intimately, no idea, no idea, but I, but I knew how, how to, I wanted to talk with somebody and be able to make meaning with somebody. So I only did that with my really good girlfriends or there were a few men that I could talk with. And, and that's what, mainly what I wanted to do was to talk with them. But as I think about this whole thing about people pleasing, though, I, I just remember something that was on Facebook this week, and it was uh, it was a case situation, and it said, if you were at a social gathering, and your partner, in this case they said he, but it could have been she too, your partner put a hand on your lips so that you would stop talking, like shh, how would you respond? And I watched one response after another show up on Facebook, one response after another. And whatever would you have put on that if your partner had stopped you from talking in mid-sentence? I mean, at this age, I'd go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but I don't know. I would wither up in uh, back in my people-pleasing days, my youth, mm -hmm. before I had any confidence. Uh I would have withered up into a little ball and got quiet. And what was, what purpose would that serve? What does withering up? I would have pleased that my partner right. because I, I was asked to be quiet and I did it. Yep. Yeah. Here's the thing. I think people pleasing comes from are not having been affirmed. And so we're trying to get the affirmation, as you said, not having ever been told, you're competent, you do this well. Right. Uh, big head, swollen head. Girls, we're not supposed to have that. We're supposed to be modest, cover right. up 
bodies. Um, one of the men that I dated, his mother used to always say to him and his sisters, cover your modesty, cover your modesty. What does that mean? Right. Don't, don't let any part of your body show the people. Right. I think also the fear underneath it was, and I want to ask you this, if you didn't people please, what would have happened to you? If you didn't please your mother by by doing her chores, you know, by being the parentified kid, if you didn't please the teachers in school, if you didn't please people, what would happen? What would they do to you? I did want to be the teacher's pet a lot. And I would talk to them. I was not a good student at all. So I figured I had to be liked by them in order for me to to go pass, you know. I was very smart. I do remember that. Mm -hmm. And I, I invite you to give yourself credit for being very savvy. That took a lot of emotional intelligence to know <laughs> if I can be, have a relationship with my teacher, she won't, she won't make fun of me when I can't read. Right. And she'll find jobs for me to do. And they, girl, they all found jobs for you, right? You were the they person. Did. That, I did have jobs. And you did the script. You were like the writer. Yeah, I can copy, but I couldn't read. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, until somebody finally caught on and helped, right? Right. And see, I I think I want to talk about this because I, I believe in my case and in many cases, and I'm going to write an article about this, uh, that people pleasing comes from fear. Fear of being hurt. Failed, right. Shamed looked down upon, excluded, seen as less than, failed. If you're a failure, people make fun of you. People right. people bully you. Um, and so and in my case, and I think there are many other trauma survivors like me, if I didn't please my father, his fist was only a heartbeat away. He was violent, and I could see his temperament or his temper go from regular to flaring up just just like that. He and and what I realized as an adult, Denise, is when adults get out of control with children, it terrifies children. Right. And you've seen? Have you seen little kids come to the classroom who are afraid of adults until they get to feel safe? Yeah. Uh which that's one of, one of the oftentimes we would do a survey about what who what kind of children trigger you ah, and good. Uh, one of the my triggering type child is one who's do you like it did i do good mm -hmm. which i believe that was my own uh style in mm -hmm. you know begging for i don't know feedback Begging for acceptance, too, you know? Right. I mean, you were really savvy to befriend your teachers. So they would say, well, I can, I'll ask Denise to do this. She'll clean the erasers. I'll ask Denise to do this. She'll, yeah. you know, I'll she'll. I'll move the chairs. I'll sweep every corner of the classroom. Mm -hmm. I would do it's, stuff. <laughs> you did stuff. And I did stuff to my people pleasing was to to stay alive. I, I And in a way, yours was, too, huh? Yeah. To survive the world that I was in. That's right, honey. I think that traumatized children become traumatized adults who don't forget that we're supposed to please others. And a lot of women, more than men, are taught to take care of others, please others, and if you're, you know, if you're 20 years old and you're listening, you might be thinking, oh, cool. <laughs> I don't do that. And you know what I say about that? Yippee skippy. I'm really glad about that. Yeah. And I also say that there will be somebody, sadly, for each one of us that tries to bully us, tries to put us in our place because the person has more power. And... The threat beneath the surface is I've got physical stature and power over you. And so don't mess up. 
You might get fired from your job. You might not get a promotion. You might get shamed in public. You might get put down. If something goes wrong and I did it, I'm not going to take responsibility for that. It's my assistant. She only did right the right thing. I wouldn't have done that. It was she gave me the wrong information. We blame others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and women learn to take the blame. And in fact, I, how is that said to us? Um, you know, make him make him feel good about himself and uh, right. build him up. Build him up. <laughs> I mean, I I had also so that was my father. The narcissist needed to always feel like he was in charge, and if he wasn't, his violence was was the price I would pay. It really did feel as if I were dying because when I would black out, I didn't know if I was coming back to life or not. Right. And I, you know, I'm, I'm speaking for many children that weren't allowed to have voices. I wasn't to say things like this. So people pleasing was either had to do it to get by and survive, right. had to do it because we weren't ever getting positive or, or no one was saying I love you in any which way except negative ways and so we learned to do like as you learned so well to say I was a bad student well girl you were an excellent student at surviving right you were right. an excellent student and yet you're telling the truth when you say you know the only way schools recognize kids was if they got good grades and they were smart readers and they right the certain good ones in a certain path and 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 you fit into that path in many ways just not the ways that were rewarded with grades right and i got into trouble a lot because i was what was called authority counter dependent which as you probably know means if there's somebody that shows up as a authority someone who's got authority over me, I'm going to blow them out of the water. I didn't care if a teacher was a teacher. She had to earn my respect. I didn't have respect automatically for teachers. And if someone wasn't doing something right, I didn't obey her. I remember that a teacher accused me during recess of throwing a rock at another student. And she came right over to me and she called me right in and she said, you will pay for that. And I said, what? You threw a rock at Billy. I said, I did not throw a rock at anybody. I was just standing over here, taking a break from the, whatever that whirly gig thing was, that you get dizzy on. No, I saw you throw the rock. Well, some guy nearby me had thrown a rock and she only saw me. And I knew she was wrong. I wasn't going to people please her. She, her name was Mrs. De Silva, second grade teacher. I'm five years old. She chased me around the room to paddle me. And I was fast. And she couldn't catch up with me. So she started going in the other direction. I went in the other direction. She got out of breath. She was a smoker. And she got out of breath. And the kids are going, yay, Holly, yay. <laughs> <laughs> and she, she pulled her rank. And she said, you will stay every day. And write on the board a hundred times, I will obey. I will obey. And the thing that I knew that was going to be painful was if my parents heard that I got in trouble. So I was willing not to people please until it meant I was going to be punished. And punishment meant either a beating or my mother freaking out and my father blaming for me for that, which meant either sexual abuse or a beating. So I think, I think honestly, Denise, people pleasing is based in some real sad truths. So why do we carry it into adulthood? Why, why is it that you and I didn't immediately know we could stop doing that? It has a charm. It has effectiveness mm -hmm. people like being pleased you know people like you if you're if you mm -hmm. please them so it has positive impact 
Do you think people like you being put on a pedestal even? Uh, no, I've never been put on a pedestal, but people do tend to like me. Like, uh, in, even in high school, mm -hmm. uh, people's parents always liked me. Or, or, you know, if I was, they, I don't know, they always like, their parents liked me. I think I came off, across as a good girl. Mm -hmm. Were you polite? Was, you know, until they saw me ride my bike and pop wheelies down the street, <laughs> they thought I was a good girl. <laughs> yes. So what we're talking about here is either being accepted or banished. Right. Liked or disliked. Shamed or in the inner circle. And I really subscribe to, um, oh gosh, um, I think his last name is... is I'll, it'll come to me. Uh, he wrote a book called, um, damn, this is my, my, my factual brain is not working right now, but it's, but the bottom line is, he says, the most basic need we have is to belong. Right. And if we don't belong, <clears throat> ruled by fear, and the fear is that we're going to be left out. And being left out, and here's an awful quote, it was from a sociologist at University of Maryland. She said, to be left out is to be put on the pathway to madness. Does that make sense to you? To be yeah. left out. How so, sweetie? How does that make sense to you? I mean, I've never been banished. So I don't know. Truly, but I can see how that would be the worst thing ever be banished were you ever made fun of i don't want to bring up bad memories but were you ever made fun of because you had trouble reading i don't really remember being made fun of it you know what i was made fun of from the way i walked i walked mm -hmm. on the ball of my feet mm -hmm. and my peers would call me pickle ass mm -hmm. like i walked with a pickle up my ass Oh, I get it now. It took me a minute. Thanks for explaining. Yeah, that's oh, I remember the only time that I was like teased that I can think of. What were you like tiptoeing? Is that what it was kind of like? Yeah, like on the balls. Mm hmm So my butt kind of stuck out. Sure. Have you ever considered that maybe Walking on the balls of your feet was a way where you wouldn't be noticed as much. Maybe a foot yeah. down is like a footfall. There's a footfall, but walking on our toes, walking on the, that's softer. Right. People don't, you know, we're like not seen, not heard. It yeah. could be, yeah. That could have been a physical compensation. Mm -hmm. So, what I did to physically compensate was I learned and I was told no. No one wants to see a little girl with a, without a smile on her face. So if I was sad or I was angry, well, I wasn't allowed to be angry, but if I was sad and I was like frowning, wipe that frown off your face. People don't like, they don't put a smile on your face. Did you ever get that? Um, I really was always smiling, I think. Oh, good for you. <laughs> ah, maybe. You just survived naturally. I was. I just totally did not even acknowledge those other sensations. Okay. I was only happy. <laughs> okay, way to survive. Right. That's a brilliant way to survive. You know. I reckon, but. <laughs> but what does it cost? I mean, what did it cost? Right. It took me a long time to find. You know, I had to. One of my huge efforts in adulthood has been to gen to be genuine. Mm -hmm. You know, I had to discover the, I'm still discovering those feelings. You know, I had to do a project with my first therapist because mm -hmm. I told her I was unfeeling. I have no feelings. I'm only happy <laughs> and uh, not, not joy, mm -hmm. just content, I guess, is the best way to describe it. And uh, I didn't allow any others. So I had to learn them. Mm -hmm. I had to, you know, intentionally, well, the way that I learned that I did have feelings 
but they just weren't extreme was that a thesaurus project i took each it was word, a wonderful thing mm -hmm. right and i took all the words that related to it and that was the way that i was able to discover that yes i do have feelings they're just not extreme in any direction mm -hmm. i hear yeah. you girl and, and i as a people pleaser had to literally had to learn two things i had to teach myself how to hug i was afraid of people touching me and i had to let myself be hugged and i chose to hug people it was i was like scared to death inside you know because any closeness in my family meant harm either right. sexual abuse or some other kind of harm and i had to learn when my mouth was dry that I was afraid. When my palms were sweating, I was afraid. I had to go back to the very simple, mad, like Fred Rogers, thank you, mad. What do I do with mad that I have? I wasn't allowed to feel mad, sad, fearful. I wasn't allowed to be fearful and show it. Um, hurting, in pain. I wasn't allowed to have anything, but... I but was I allowed to be afraid. Yeah. I was afraid to go upstairs by myself to go to the bathroom. So I would yeah. sit on the step and wait for somebody, please go upstairs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you're that's where my father died, I think. I was yes. a man up there, you know? And yeah. uh, and that's traumatizing, sweetheart. So I was allowed to feel that. Well, I mean, I, I'm not sure I could say I'm afraid. Well, I think I did know I was afraid, but I would just sit there until somebody was going up. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes I had accidents. My Wait, nickname was Keep Rain in the Pants. Damn, I remember that. <laughs> I remember a time in, in my crib that I had to pee so badly and had to get up and out of the crib. Now, I was in the crib for much longer than I should have been. They just didn't want to get bed for me or right. whatever. So I was in this crib and I knew I had to pee, but I was afraid of going out into the dark hallway. Because my father, you know, that man might be roaming the hallways and I was afraid he would snatch me up and I had to walk down the hall to get to the bathroom. So one one night as a little kid, I remember, I'm just going to I'm going to pee. I can't hold it any longer. And I did. And I remember what my mother did. She came in. She saw that I had wet the bed and she came in in the morning. I mean, I slept in that wet mess, squeezed to the edge of the crib as far as I could. But. She, the first thing she said she did was to call my father. Look what Holly did. She wet her bed again, you know, and that meant I would be punished. So people pleasing is a deep, deep strategy, survival strategy that children do so we can survive to adulthood. And the sad thing is, Denise, we carry it into adulthood. And I want to read, we've probably got about five minutes left here. I want to read something about a trait that adult children have. Um, and the trait is, ready for this? See if it's true for you and people listening. Is it true for you? We get guilt feelings when we stand up for ourselves instead of giving in to others. Yeah. I, yeah, honey. What happened? Uh, yeah. to yourself? You know, when I recently quit my job, mm -hmm. I wrote my letter of, resignation I uh, put in there that I am so sorry that I disappointed Gabby my supervisor like that that was my guilt you know I felt guilty to disappoint her mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the first are I hear you because my first response is isn't I have a right it is more now but it wasn't how do I take care of myself my first response is am I going to hurt somebody by doing this, when I got feedback, I think I talked about this last week, that sometimes what I say can trigger people. I found myself getting really angry saying, I can't make anybody else feel any which way. Right. That person is responsible for how she feels. And so, um, I mean, I have all these safeguards that I do. Usually I hold up the number for people to call if something we say triggers somebody. Right. But I'm I'm conscious about saying something with boundaries. Like if I'm going to say something that's painful, like when I talked about the 
possibility of an animal getting hurt. One of the stories I told, which was true for me, I said to people up front, don't worry, there's a danger to the animal, but the animal doesn't get hurt. You know, to let people know you're going to be safe. Right. And that's a way of people pleasing. But it's what I had to come to, and I came to it just this last weekend, was I have a right to tell my truth with love. If I have the intention as I'm telling my truth is to get even with somebody, yeah, to punish somebody, uh, if it's left over resentment towards somebody, that's not going to be the healthiest thing. Right. But if I can say, if I can say, I was really angry, I was really angry and I couldn't say it out loud. And so when my father did this, well, I did, I said this, when my father told me I was too stupid to get a scholarship and I had to go take a scholarship exam, my first response was the people pleasing survival response. He's got to be right. He's my father. He's the authority get guilt feelings if you stand up for yourself. So, but by the time I took the school bus and got to school, I was angry. And I used that anger to const to focus. And I focused and I knocked the top off. That's how I always said it. I did I really achieve that, conquer that test. And so, what, because we were taught as people pleasers to feel guilty if we said what we needed. I became right, which I knew I needed to quit my job, but yes. I still had guilt for disappointing my boss. And can you see what what do you learn from that now? Or what do you what do you want from that now that you look back and see that? Uh, I mean, that's probably why she liked me because I was trying to please her. You know, mm. I don't know. Well, I've done but that too. That people wonder yeah. whether people really like you for you yes. or whether they like you for what you do. And there's that, the cost. Right. Because as a friend of mine says, if I'm always presenting my false self, you know, the part of myself you'll like, then if I show up as my true self, it's probably not going to work. Right. You know? And so here's what this, this, this is a book written for trauma survivors. And it says, perhaps the greatest loss we suffered as children in a dysfunctional family or alcoholic family was losing our ability to stand up for ourselves. The aggressive demand by the family to deny what was actually happening was extraordinary. True. It was a really, we don't tell anybody what's going on here. And it was extraordinary. And for a defenseless child, overwhelming. As children, Instead of challenging the family's denial system, we played the only role we could, which was to passively give in or submit. By giving in, we are unconsciously playing our role of dissociating from our feelings. And the payoff is we don't have to have feelings. We get out of touch with our feelings. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I had to reacquaint myself with all the feelings. Reacquaint ourselves as if as if getting born again, right? Right, right. The next, next paragraph says, although we may have sensed that our submitting submission was wrong, we denied our truth by self-betrayal or self-abandonment. Um, or we betrayed or abandoned Wait, we could have, we died countless small deaths as we joined in the dysfunction of denying the obvious and in turn denied our true self the birthright of expression. This interaction was repeated repeatedly, regularly, even hourly until the, it became routine, routine for us to don't deny ourselves and to give in to the unconscious or conscious demands of the family system. So deeply ingrained was this habit that we can read another body's posture, tone of voice, facial expressions. Even before our own perception can be formulated, we act out of our passive submissive role to thwart any awareness of having our own viewpoint. We preempt any thought of our own beliefs or needs by constantly scanning those we interact with for their needs. What do they need? 
so that we can react and fill those needs. Thus robbed of our inner senses, we wander and we wonder, who am I in all of this? Right. Oh, what do you feel when you hear all of that, Denise? Yeah, it's the truth. Who am I? I'm, you know, when I uh, separated from my first long-term partnership, a fifteen-year relationship, mm -hmm. I, I had no idea. I mean, I knew I liked kids. I knew I liked working with kids, but <clears throat> I really had no idea who I was. I was gone you know, in, in people yes. pleasing and, you know, I had to rediscover and I have. What would you know? I know you've done a lot of work on this really. And it, it shows, what would you say to that little, little Denise, that little sassy five-year-old that was like riding her bike to be free. And yet every time she got home, she had to cover things up. Right. What would you say to that little kid? Um, well, you know, right now I'm working with, I have an inner 13 year old who, yeah. ha, who has uh, become, uh, well, she took on cigarette smoking to be adultified mm -hmm. or to yep. be adult. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm struggling with her right now, trying to bring her forward and tell her, you know, that I figured out how to be an adult now. You do not have to, you were uh -huh. You were young and you were not supposed to be adult yet. And uh, I'm trying because I'm uh, smoking like a chimney right now, which I oh, go through okay. periods of yeah. smoking. smoking. Mm -hmm. And you so, worked since really I'm, hard on that. Yeah. Yeah. So, since I've changed my, quit my job, I have just been smoking oh, kind of French. Yeah. And uh, I don't really want to, I mean, Mm -hmm. I love smoking, but I don't, it's not, it can't be good for your body. You know, mm -hmm. there's tars and nicotines like waiting there to do bad things. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to be a smoker, but I'm mm -hmm. also, so I just realized this weekend that there's a, it's this 13 year old. I do a picture of her when I was in therapy. She's very right. mad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I think she was mad that she was forced to be adult then or whatever. And uh, she got to so be the badass right now. I'm trying to give her a voice and trying Good. to bring her forward with me now because you don't need to smoke to be an adult. And, mm -hmm. you know, she doesn't, she didn't need to be an adult. Even then she was 13. That is not the age of adulthood. Really, uh, you know, like 27 is adulthood in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Girl, you're, you're doing such a wise thing because uh, I have a friend who smoked since he was and drank since he was like a choir boy or what would they call it? Um, yeah, choir what, boy. Uh, choir boy, but also no acolyte or uh, uh, something. So the guy that the little boy that got to work with the priest, girls couldn't do that. Servers, they're called the servers. servers now. Right. But servers. We called them altar boys. Altar boys. There were never altar girls back in the day. We couldn't no. do that. I but, wanted to be an altar boy so I, bad. <laughs> you know, right. How many girls did we couldn't do it? Now today I see girls up there and they're they bored. Do do I think, girl. I, yeah. I get it. I, I get it. I loved the ritual of the Catholic <laughs> faith and ringing the bells. Ringing the bells. And oh the my smoke God. and all that. All uh, that stuff. Yeah. Recently yeah. I've been at uh going to church. I went to church twice recently because mm -hmm. my ex coworker's daughter, she has two mm -hmm. daughters, one daughter's in sports, one daughter's at Catholic school trying to become a Catholic now. So I have to go stand with her in church a couple of times. Okay. All and right. And I, so you, you saw the I, now there's a girl. Again. There's a girl up there. And I was like, all right. <laughs> So wonderful. Oh, my God. But here's what my friend who became an alcoholic and a smoker early on, he was from a traumatized family. And he said to me, he didn't know how to be an adult. He was an adult and he still had a lot of things to learn, as, as I do. And he said it was the motion, lighting the, lighting the cigarette, bringing it up to your mouth, 
how you held it in your hand. He said all the of those ritual of it, the ritual, and they were gestures that only adults knew. Right. So when I did all that stuff, he said I was an adult, and when I quit smoking, which he said was harder to quit than drinking, when he quit smoking, he said he he felt he had to give up all those props and gestures that had proven to people you're I'm an adult. You got to take me seriously. Right. Ah, sweetie, how would you? Uh, given that people um, are probably listening and thinking, oh my God, these, these two women are talking about how serious it must have been for kids to have to people please um, and to, and to that, for that to become their false self, but it felt like their true right. self. Instead of being loved by their parent. Mm-hmm. I mean, if we would have been loved by our parent and cherished and encouraged and all those things, if we could have felt that, we wouldn't have had to do that. But we didn't, it wasn't available. It wasn't available. And I know, for example, I um, there's a question that I, I couldn't bear. It's a question for people who are trauma survivors. It's a question I would get angry at or I just would reject it. I couldn't bear it. And the question was, what would your life would have been like if you had somebody that loved you and told you they loved you and it hurt so much for me to even imagine that, that I couldn't do it for the longest time. Now I'm getting better. Now I'm I getting- love seeing my nephew because he is so loved by both of his parents. They mm-hmm. love him. Um, they were, they both had difficult childhoods as well. Mm-hmm. My sister and her husband mm-hmm. and, but they are just loving that kid to death. And it's so good to be around him And his, you know, he knows he's lovable. And his smile is like, goes from one horizon to another. I mean, the picture you put, you sent me of him with his eyes are so full of wonder, like a kid's eyes and adult eyes can be. And his smile is so big and he's not self-conscious. And it's, it's so beautiful. That's it. He's loved by his parents, both love him and they want to do what's best for him. You know, and I'm, it's a beautiful yes. thing. I love seeing it. Oh, I know. And you're part of it because he loves being with you. He, he does. He's safe with you and he can play with you and you know what he will love. And in that case, being pleasing with somebody is like you're getting you're getting the love back. Not right. You're not buying it, but you're showing. I love you, stinky face. And he's like right. so in love and with it's love. Earning, it's earning his love too, you know, like. Yes. I mean, not that I have to go out of my way. I just am myself with him. And Mm -hmm. it turns out that he's very comfortable with me. And that's awesome. I love it. So let's continue this week, next week, because what we talked about today is like, you just gave us an example of a beautiful boy. He's beautiful and he's not self-conscious and he's just got wonder in his face and and he's loved. So I would expect he doesn't have to do the survival things you did. Right. Please. He does not have to people please. He just, he's loved because of who he, because he's a human. And uh, and in my case, I was terrified of being annihilated if I didn't take care of those older people. In fact, become the adult so that they, because they didn't know how. So we've introduced this, this week the topic of people pleasing, where it's it's deep sources in loss and abandonment and betrayal, and how we just learn to give up our identity. And now, as survivors, as adults, wanting to have be true to ourselves and have our gifts, how on earth do we move from that? Since we want to repeat those relationships all over again, I married my father. Right. You know, I didn't think I was, but I married my father, a charming, charming man who was a narcissist because narcissists do that. You know, I married him and it took me and I was so terrified, terrified to leave that relationship. But I knew I was dying if right. I stayed in the relationship. So next week, we'll, we'll pick up on how how we can take our broken hearts and turn them into art. And I want to say... Thank you to everybody who listens to this. And we're going to invite you to join us. Put the word out, too. If you see this, just share the link because we'll be with you 
whenever Denise can be here, and I'll be with you every Monday afternoon, three o'clock East Coast, London, 8 p.m., um, probably six in the morning or something in <laughs> Pondicherry, India. But you know what? Oh, this is recorded. So yeah, it would be nice yeah, to ahead. expand the crowd. Yeah, let's do that. Let's start. We're starting to, to just ask people. I'm, I'm putting out. Yeah, so maybe I'll send something to you. If, if you haven't joined us for a while, please do. Because we had a team. We had a yeah. whole crew. And so let's get let's invite them back. Denise, thank you so much. Thank you. My sister in love here. My sister who's willing yep, to tell. We keep this. learning and growing the whole time. Learning and growing and facing it all with self-love first. Hardest thing to learn. Okay.